Good evening. Thanks for being here tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. Glad to have you here with us. As we get started, I've got a couple of updates for you on our prayer list. Um, John West is in the hospital. He had a fall earlier and uh, is recovering from that. They're also doing some tests and some scans for cancer with him, so please keep him in your prayers. Um, he is hoping to get some answers, at least, to what's been going on. And also, Alan Smith's wife is still sick. We've been asked to re continue to remember her in our prayers as well. Upcoming activities, the ladies' exercise class is scheduled to meet tomorrow in the fellowship hall. If there's a change, then uh, we will uh, you'll get a text message about that. But uh, that's coming up in the fellowship hall tomorrow. In the high school youth group, if you're attending EU, you'll leave the building next Friday. Yeah, it says on Friday at 4. It's next Friday at 4. Sorry, you'll leave the building next Friday at 4. Uh, we'll have a brief VBS meeting in front of the auditorium this Sunday, immediately following morning worship service. This is for anybody who's interested in helping us teach or if you're interested in helping work. We're, we're going to talk construction and sets and some of the ideas we've got. So uh, if you can come to that meeting, we'll keep it brief and we'll be down front right after services this Sunday morning. This Sunday afternoon at 5.15, there'll be a congregational budget meeting. The elders will be conducting that here in the auditorium. And this Sunday night, we'll have church at 6, so, you know, come back for that too. Breakfast Together group has changed. They're going to meet Friday, January 15th at 9.30 at the Eastgate Restaurant. Everybody's welcome. If you'd like to come eat breakfast together, that's Friday, January 15th at 9.30 at Eastgate. I, I'm sorry, I just read what's printed. So uh, so it is Friday. Is that not the 15th? That's the 14th. Okay, Friday the 14th at 9.30. There you go. See, y'all know, you don't need me to make announcements. You know this stuff. Breakfast together is Friday the 14th at 9.30. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for the Navigating Grace class that begins Sunday the 16th at 5 o'clock. I do know that's the right date and time. It'll run for 12 weeks, but we need you to sign up in advance because we're ordering books ahead of time. Uh, that class is, is just going to be a Bible study, an instructional class uh, about recovery and restoration, specifically from addiction. And, and there'll just be a lot of good information in there. But that's going to meet Sundays at 5, starting January the 16th. But sign up in the lobby so we can get you a book ordered. And if you've got questions, see me or Tammy James. The WOW group will be going to Moonlight in Owensboro Saturday, January the 22nd at 11 a.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby for that. So if you're planning on attending most of these stuff, go let somebody know because we need a good count. So sign up for that. Leading us tonight in our devotional service, Rodney Newton has our opening prayer. Leland Steely is our song leader. David Arthur has our devotional. And Josh Terry has our closing prayer. If there's nothing further, let's begin our devo. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Thunder in his footsteps, a lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, and so you better be believing. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, we know that he's Our awesome. God. Darling. 
darkness in the void of the night. My God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. The judgment and wrath He poured out on Sodom. His mercy and grace He gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our, our God, God is an awesome God. Yes, we know our that He's God, awesome. Our God is awesome. pray. God and Father in heaven, we're thankful for the blessings of another day of life and we can be together here this evening to, to fellowship together and to have a period of Bible study. We're thankful for all the blessings and for the freedoms that we have here, such as being able to meet together here from time to time. And we pray as we do so, we'll always be able to increase our knowledge of your word and be able to grow stronger in our faith. We're thankful for the story of Jesus that we have to study about and to read about. Pray we'll always be ready and willing to share that with others. We're mindful of those who are sick on a prayer list and so many that are shut on, in. <clears throat> especially mindful of Brother John West and his upcoming test. We pray that you'll uh, give him good results. Ask you to give us alert minds now as we go to uh, enter into our Bible study and just pray that you'll watch over and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening. It's good to be here this evening. Uh, as a kid, one of my favorite stories uh, was David and Goliath. You know, I, I uh, enjoyed the underdog story. I identified because my name was David and I thought that was fun. Um, and when I was in high school, I went on a mission trip uh, to Honduras and we did skits for some of the kids that were there. And we would have someone read the story in Spanish and then someone would be telling us what was happening in English so we could act it out. And uh, by then I was in high school and uh, I, needless to say, I did not play David. Uh, I much more identified with Goliath at the time. Uh, and uh, after the skit, one of the kids uh, came up to me and he asked me what my, what my name was. So I said Goliath, or no, I said David, because my name's David and he got confused. He's like, no, Goliath. And I couldn't explain it to him that I'm not actually Goliath. My name's David. It was really confusing. <laughs> but I enjoyed that story. But as I grew up and I learned a little bit more about that story, I learned that it changed. Um, I, I, I saw a video uh, recently by Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. He's a Jewish author and scholar. And he talked about the concepts and the... Uh, some of the, the history behind what happened when David and Goliath battled. Um, we know it as an underdog story, and he kind of ruined that. Um, we look at, a, uh, first of all, where they were at the time. When uh, the Israelites and the Philistines were battling, um, they were, most of the Israelites for, were from the side of Israel that was on the mountains. The, the Philistines came from Crete. They came from the island side where there was plains and flat area. In between those two areas was lots of hills and valleys. Um, and that's where David found them in kind of a stalemate. Um, they were both at the top of a hill and neither wanted to go in the valley and lose their ground because that made you vulnerable. It's like king of the hill. They were both on top of the hill and neither one of them, one of them wanted to come down. So what happened, there was a style of battle where instead of one side coming down and all the bloodshed and you lose all your people in this battle, you send your biggest, most intimidating warrior down the hill. So we know that the Philistines sent Goliath. Um, there are, are records that they try to say he was uh, at least six foot nine. 
and, and big and intimidating. So the Israelites didn't have anyone to send. Um, so they sent David because he volunteered. And you know, again, we think of that as the underdog story. But we look at, the, at a lot of things that are in scripture and are in history and, and learn how David had some advantages that, uh, that aren't super clear when we just read the story for what it is. Um, Goliath was big. He had uh, tools for close combat battle. He had armor. He had swords. Um, David had a sling. This wasn't just like the slingshot that you, you play with when you're a kid. I had one of those. You could, my brother shot me with it. No bones are broken. I was fine. Um, but what David used was a, a big sling that he was swinging around up to six revolutions a second. Uh, so, and he, the stones that he were using were from that area were, were really dense. So he had what was the equivalent in accuracy and of power of a 45 caliber gun that we would have today. So he's going up against this great big guy with this leather armor to, to withstand hits from a sword. Uh, David literally bought a, a, brought a gun to a knife fight. Um, the, at the time, the battles were, were won by, by the archers and by the slingers because they had such an advantage. Um, he was he was going in knowing exactly what he was what to expect. You know he he trained with this with this sling, um, and Goliath had trained differently. He was close combat. We also look at why was he so big. Um, we when you read through the the scripture in in First Samuel, you see that they mention things like he was led down the path by his shield bearer. Um, why, why was the six foot nine man of, of just built to be a warrior, why did he have to be led by a shield bearer? We also look, um, as, he, as David comes down the hill with his, with his staff and his sling, uh, Goliath says, uh, why do you come at me with sticks? Am I a dog? Well, that's not a stick, that's a sling. Why did he call it a stick? Um, so uh, in the medical community, they've debated why Goliath is so big. Um, there, there's a disease called acromegaly. Um, it is a, in, with your pituitary gland in your brain. I've, I've had an MRI that looked at my pituitary gland. I do not have acromegaly. But what it does is pushes on your pituitary gland, which is behind your eyes. So they think that, and it also affects your human growth hormone. So First of all, that's why Goliath is so big, but it pushes on the back of your eyes and it gives you terrible eyesight. So we think that, David, that Goliath probably couldn't see that well. So he couldn't see that what David had was a sling instead of sticks. He had trouble walking down the hill by himself because he couldn't see where he was walking. Um, and, and that also means that he, he didn't have the, the eyesight to see the rock flying towards his face. Um, he was in no way in a situation where he was the giant versus the underdog. David had all the advantages except being smaller than Goliath, but he had a tool to use at every turn and every difficulty he saw in battle. So that kind of ruins the underdog story. I kind of like, as a kid, we, we hear that story and we think that, that, uh, that David was just never going to win this battle. And we're encouraged by that because he did win this battle. So when you learn about these things, that at, at first it kind of disappoints. But I, don't, I, I think to me this is just as encouraging because everyone felt like David had this giant problem to deal with. He had this huge thing that no one thought would, that he would be able to overcome. We face things every day that aren't six foot nine pituitary gland altered warriors, but we face big, difficult things. Even uh, Elaine and I have, have talked about this. The last couple of years, we've, we've dealt with a lot of things that were, have been really hard. And thinking back on them, they seem way bigger than, uh, they seemed way bigger at the beginning before we got through the end of them. That's the kind of thing David was facing. 
but he put his faith in God and the things that God had given him and the tools that he had to accomplish the giant thing in front of him. What felt like a giant was nothing because he had the tools that God had given him to beat the giant. Sometimes it's hard for us to find those tools. Sometimes it's hard for us to see those tools. But when we're facing those difficult things, all we need to do is put our faith in God and the tools that he's given us to get through life. One of those big tools that he's given us is Jesus and the forgiveness that we have from him, that when we do mess up, that we are forgiven and we can still face the battle of life when the end goal is to win that battle by spending eternity with God in heaven. But we have tools in our community. We have tools in our church. We have tools in the scripture. And when we trust those things that don't always seem apparently, don't always seem like the best thing at the time, or you can get distracted from those things. That's when we put our faith in God using those tools that we can defeat the giant that's in front of us. Uh, Romans chapter... uh, Chapter 8, verse 31 says that if God is for us, who can be against us? It's one of my favorite verses because it approaches that that we we feel so small when we're facing those, those trials. We feel so unprepared when we face difficult things. But God is with us. God has given us the tools that we need in every situation. All we have to do is see them and use them. So if you are facing difficulties today... We, uh, we want to use one of our tools to help you with that. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. We want to read the scripture and find the answer for you. So if there's something that you need, a battle that you're facing, we hope you can come forward as we stand and as we sing. Hark the gentle voice. Your only son goes into but you have said.
us get started with class tonight. Thank you for being in here. I want to thank Goliath for that great Devo tonight. Appreciate that. I am uh, I'm always jealous of those five and ten talent folks, you know. I'm thankful David can lead singing and speak and do other stuff. He is a very talented guy. Let's, uh, let's start off with a word of prayer tonight. Would you bow with me? God, you're good to us. You're gracious to us. Thank you for that. We pray that your blessing will be on our time together tonight. Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we look into your word, as we seek to know you better. And God, we pray that even as we seek to know you better, to grow in our faith, that we could also share that with others around us. Pray that you will guide us and be with us. Father, we pray that you would be with our world right now with the challenges that we face, and we pray that we would be reminded of those tools that you've given us, the love that you've given us and your plan for us not just to be saved, but also to live this life the best way possible. Guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're going to start a brand new study, and uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about getting to know God. But when you get to know somebody, when you meet somebody new, what's one of those first things you want to know? You meet somebody and y'all are kind of talking. Well, what are those get to know you questions that we like to ask? Yeah, what's your name? That's important. Want to know your name? What else? What do you do? That's it. Rodney, you got the first two. That's it. What's your name and what do you do? That's a lot of times how we define ourselves. What's your name and what do you do? What else, though? There's another big one. Where are you from? That's right, you know. Uh, Heather grew up in, in central Indiana, and she came to Nashville, Tennessee to go to college, and she said, I never knew I was a Yankee until I came to Tennessee. And I said, well, we were happy to tell you, because when you get to college and you say, where are you from? You know, we want to know. I, I remember there was a gal in line, one of our first days there at school, a gal in line from Michigan. And uh, way up in the UP part of Michigan, and she was going through line, and, and the, the cafeteria worker said something about, oh, I love your accent, but I don't have an accent, she said, and we all kind of laughed a little bit. It was breakfast because she got up there, and she said, what's that? And she said, grits. She said, what's grits? And she said, what's well, corn? She said, okay, I'll try one, and then we all really laughed. But we get to know people by, what's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? All those are ways that, that we learn. And, and, you know, when we say, what's your name? The other part of that is kind of, you know, what's your family? If we're if it's a local, like a small town, and you say, hey, did you grow up here? Yeah, okay, well, well who are you kin to? Where do you fit in, in the family tree? We want to know. And, and if you're asking those questions, it anticipates we're going to talk some more later. You know, if you're checking out, you might well be friendly with the person who checks out your groceries or your items at a store somewhere, and you'll say, hey, how's your day? Oh, it's been kind of busy. Well, okay, you know, or moisture is getting cold out. We'll make small talk, but you don't, you don't even bother to swap names because you don't anticipate really seeing that person or getting to know them anymore. But if you think you'll see this person, then you give them your name and you learn their name. You know, teachers, that's one of the things they do when they get into class, that first day of class, man, they are going over that list. And you ask teachers, parents come up with some crazy spellings for some crazy names. And, and, and teachers know, I, I want to learn that name. I want to know that name. Names are important. It literally is who we are, but it's also a little bit of how we reveal who we are. And, and so, you know, what, what you call somebody says something about your relationship. You know, when, when I coached academic team at middle school, I was Mr. Salisbury to everybody. And, and that, that, was a, that, that was an element of our relationship. They didn't, they didn't call me David. Now, there were two kids at South Middle School that called me Dad. And, and that was indicative of our relationship as well. When I was growing up, I could, and Mom taught school, I'd go down the hall, Mom, Mom, and she wouldn't turn around. Miss Salisbury, and she'd turn around because she was at school, and that's what she was expecting. So what we call someone, even when we know their name, is also indicative of our relationship. And so when you look at names in the Bible, they're important. Adam is given the opportunity by God to name all the creatures. That's a powerful blessing. God says, I want you to name everything. But God names Adam and Eve because he holds that power there. 
And names of God in the Bible are what we're going to look at on Wednesday nights for a while. And There's literally hundreds of names of God. We won't go through all of them, and I'm going to kind of group them a little bit. But we're going to learn about God. And so I would invite you on Wednesday nights, bring your Bibles, take some notes. We're going to jump around a little bit as we go through this topic. And, uh, and if you've got some questions, by all means, let me know. And as we study each one of these categories of names of God, I want you to ask something about yourself. Say, what do I learn about God from this? What, what is the fact that people called God by this name or this designation? What does that teach me about God? And then also, how do I see God active in the world in this way? Because frequently when people gave God a title or a name, it was because of what they saw him doing. And so they, they would give God a name based on what they had seen in his life. So maybe we can look in our life and say, what do I learn about God? How do I see him active in this way? And, and how do I respond in light of what I've learned? The first names that God has ever given in the scriptures all refer to his exalted position. They, they speak of names of worship. And, and, you know, we say, when we talk about God being uh, exalted, that, that's a good preachery word, but we also talk about God being sovereign. What does it mean that God is sovereign? What is a sovereign? A ruler, that's right. A sovereign is a ruler, a king. So when we say God is sovereign, it means he's king. What is that? What does that have to do? What do we mean when we talk about God's sovereignty? In the New Testament, we talk about the lordship of Christ. It's the same idea. What does that mean? Probably a pretty important concept for us to understand, don't you think? Somebody has said there's two important rules of life. Number one, there is a God. Number two, you are not it. That's kind of the idea that when we talk about God is sovereign. He's, he's in charge, we're not. To say that Christ is Lord is to say, I'm not Lord. The, to say that, that God is king is to say, I'm not the king, he is. So when we talk about the lordship of Christ, when we talk about God being sovereign, he rules and runs things. You know, I've heard a rumor that maybe... There's going to be a little bit of snow tomorrow. Now, there's some folks that are really excited about that, although they're not quite as excited anymore because they already got the day off of school, so they're okay with it. But you know what kids do when they find out there's a chance of snow? What do they do? What's that? Well, they cheer, yeah, but I mean, I remember when we were in elementary school, and I remember when my kids were in elementary school, man, we were flushing ice cubes down the toilet. We always heard if you wore your pajamas inside out when you went to bed that night, it might snow. Man, we would, we'd take white crayons, you put a white crayon under your pillow. We had all kinds, we had a million different things you could do. Why did I do all that? Why did my kids do all that? Because they wanted to snow. They want to get out of school. Yeah. They did all that because they said, hey, we want to do whatever we can to make it snow. Did any of that stuff work? Nah. Not a bit. We can't control the weather. They can't make it snow any more than the farmers can make it rain or make it not rain. Except Bob when he prays, right? And even then, Bob says, hey, I'm going to talk to the weatherman. Even the guy on TV with his maps and his computers, he's not making it rain or snow or be sunshiny or anything else. He's just telling us his best guess. And we all know sometimes his best guess is still wrong. When we say God is sovereign, he's the guy who can say, you know what? The weatherman says it's going to snow tomorrow. I say it's going to be 85 and sunny tomorrow. Guess what? He can make it 85 and sunny tomorrow. And all the school officials are going, please don't, because we'll be in big trouble. But God's the guy who can control that. We look at the stock market and we say, hey, this is what I think is going to happen. And I make, a, I, I make investments literally based off what I think is going to happen. God says, I know the future. 
I know exactly what's going to happen. I can tell you exactly what that stock is going to be worth tomorrow. I can tell you what's going to happen 100 years from now because he's sovereign. He, he, he knows and he controls what we cannot know and cannot control. And so to talk about the lordship of Christ and the sovereignty of God is to acknowledge that he is higher than us. And that's literally what it means to exalt someone, that they're higher than us. And that's the first name of God that we run into. If you got your Bibles, um, we'll look in Genesis, but probably the best place to see this title is in Psalms. Uh, so turn to Psalm 97. Get my Bible to go there. Psalm 97. It says, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His, lightning lights the, his lightnings light the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his glory and all the people see, or his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you gods, little g. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. And here it is, verse 9. For you, O Lord, are the most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The title there, the Hebrew, is El Elyon. It means the God who is above, the God who is higher. God Most High is the, the most common translation there. And, and it's the first title that God is given by anyone. Abraham and his family grew up first in Ur and then later in Haran. And they grew up in a world that worshipped a lot of gods. They looked around and they saw the sun going across the sky and they said, there must be a God that makes that sun go across the sky, whether he carries it in a chariot or pushes it or whatever he has to do, but there's a God who takes care of the sun. And then they saw the moon come up and they said, oh, that must be the moon God. And specifically in Abraham's family, we know that they worshiped that moon God. The names in Abraham's family are all based off an ancient Semitic moon God. And so... Abraham and his family would have grown up worshiping gods. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2 tells us a little bit about that. As Joshua speaks to his people who are struggling with what they're going to do, and Joshua calls all his folks together and he says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods, plural. So Abraham grew up in a family that worshipped lots of gods. When you have a whole lot of gods that kind of work together to manage the world, that's called a pantheon. If you're familiar with Greek mythology or Roman mythology or Egyptian mythology, there's all these different gods that interact with each other. That's a pantheon of gods. And that's what most everybody thought was normal in Abraham's time. Rachel, when, when Jacob and Rachel leave, as Rachel's headed out the door, it says she steals her father's teraphim, is the Hebrew word there. It's household gods. He had his own little collection of idols, and they would have been very valuable. And she steals those and puts them in her saddle and takes them as part of her financial inheritance. Lots of, again, we said that we talked about Abraham's relatives. Sarai, the, the name Sarai means queen, but it was also the title of Ningal, the moon goddess. Milka is the name of the goddess Malkatu, daughter of the moon god. Laban means white, which was the poetic name for the full moon. It was the title, the, the, the poetic title for the moon god as well. So Abraham grows up worshiping lots of gods. But if you look in Genesis chapter 12, he's figured something out. He's looked around and, and Genesis chapter 12 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land. I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's a great promise that becomes such a cornerstone in all the New Testament. But Abram has figured out 
There's only one God. It's not all these gods. There's one God. The idea that there is one God is referred to as monotheism, one God. And Abraham has become a monotheist. In Genesis chapter 14, he's going to say uh, that this is the, the Lord who is the God of the cosmos. He says uh, in Genesis chapter 14, and then again in Genesis chapter 24, let me get to Genesis 14. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. There's one God. He rules heaven. He rules earth. He is the one God. He is the God most high. He says in Genesis 15 that that same one God is the supreme judge of mankind. What does that mean? How did they view gods in their day? Gods had specific areas. I'm a moon god or a sun god or I was the god of farming or the god of war or whatever. But you know what else gods had? Territories. So David and Elaine live in Newburgh. If David gets in trouble with his local police, what law is he under? Indiana law, yeah. He's in trouble with Indiana police. He's under Indiana law. If I do the exact same thing David did in Henderson, Kentucky, and I get in trouble with the police, am I in any trouble with the Indiana law? Not a bit. Not one bit. Because the crime I committed was all in the territory uh, of the Kentucky law. So I'm under Kentucky law. That's how they viewed gods. Gods had territories, just like police have territories. But now you know what? If David and I violate federal law, we're both in trouble with the U.S. government because the U.S. government is the supreme judge within the United States. So when Abraham says God is the supreme judge of all mankind, God operates a court that all people everywhere have to report to. That was a powerful statement in his day of all these little tiny gods, and I'm the God of this area, and I'm the God of this area, and I'm the God over here, but I'm actually just the sun God in this little time. And Abraham says, I serve the God who is the God of everything, everywhere, and everybody. And that's what he means when he says the Lord God most high. He says, I serve the one true God, the supreme judge of mankind. But you know what? Even if there was some kind of a worldwide court that all people were amenable to, you know what that worldwide court still couldn't do? Couldn't make it snow tomorrow. Abraham says, I serve the God of everywhere. He says, I serve the God who is the judge of everyone. And in Genesis 18, he says, I serve the God who controls nature. And so this is more than any power that they have ever seen before. And then in Genesis 21, he says, you know what? Not only is this God the God of everywhere and everyone and everything. In Genesis 21, he says, this God is eternal. He's the God of every win. So here is Abraham's picture that he has stepped into from this idea of your father who served all these gods across the river. That's what Joshua said about it, the family Abraham grew up in. From all these gods who ruled little pieces of little parts, he's come to faith in one God who rules everything, everywhere, and he is eternal. He's every win. And that leads Abraham to a really important conclusion. If you get a phone call and it says, this is the IRS and there's a problem with your social security and we need you to give us your bank account number right now. And it's a really heavily accented voice and, and, and the connection is kind of bad. And it says, but we, you got to have your bank account number. Local police will be dispatched shortly. Give us your bank account number right now. What do you do? Sherry says she hangs up. Why would you hang up on the IRS when police are on their way? 
Why, why should Sherry, anybody agree Sherry ought to hang up real quick? Lots of, why would you tell Sherry to hang up when the IRS has called and said police are on their way? Too many scams. Sherry says it's a scam. She says it's not the IRS and the police aren't on their way. I don't believe them. That's what she says. Somebody else calls up and they say, Rodney, we have been trying to reach you about your vehicle's extended warranty. And they don't even get done before Rodney hangs up on them. Because I don't believe them. Abraham gets a phone call. That's the best way we could put it. Abram, pack up and move now. Where are we going? You don't need to know that. Get out now. I'll tell you when we get there. What kind of a phone call could possibly make you immediately right now just pack up and move? Leave. But my family's here. Yep, leave your family. But this is, my, this is the only place I've ever known. Yep, leave it. What kind of phone call could make you do that? God most high could. Abram said, this is the God that I have realized. Because you see, you don't leave, if your God is the God of this little area, you don't leave your area because then you're outside of that God's control. So he says, where are we going? And God says, I'll tell you when we get there. And he says, you know what, wherever we get there, wherever we are when we get there, you're God of that place too. What are we going to do? Doesn't matter because you're going to be the God of that too. How long is it going to take? Doesn't matter because you're an eternal God. So Abram, because of everything he learns about God and what it means to be the most exalted God, God most high, I'll do whatever you ask. No matter how hard. No matter what other people might think. No matter what my family thinks. No matter if it means leaving home and changing things around. When God spoke to Abraham, he obeyed immediately. And specifically in Genesis, the thing you're going to see in addition to he packs up and moves, Abraham worships God all through this. I'm going to have to watch my time because we'll run out. But Abraham worships God. That's what you do for God most high. The most exalted one. He's above everything else. You worship that God. And we'll talk about it in a minute. But let me tell you, Abraham worships God. How does Abraham worship God? What does he do to worship God in Genesis? What do you know of? What's that? Sacrifice. We'll see him, we'll see him offer sacrifices. What else? Yeah, he offered his son. In that case, he built an altar. We're going to see a couple other times he builds an altar and, and then follows through and, and does what he's asked to do. What else does Abraham do when he worships God? There's a biggie in that covenant. If worship is what you do to honor God, circumcision was one of those things Abraham did. He was willing to have surgery to honor God. Why would you do that, Abraham? He told me to. He said, I want you to be circumcised. And Abraham said, okay, that's weird, but you said it, so we'll do it. What else? We see him pray. We see him call on the name of the Lord for help. A couple of weird ones that, that we don't think of. We see him plant trees and, and build a monument. Those are common ways in his culture that you worshiped. And we see Abraham tithe. He gives money to God to celebrate the blessings that God has given him. All those are ways that Abraham worshiped. And through it all, he calls God this name, El Elyon. The word El is the Hebrew word for God, lowercase g. 
It's the most common title for any of the gods in that area. If you look at all those cultures over there, all of their gods were El this or El, El Baal or El this, and that was always the title, the God of, the God of. Frequently, you would hear the word Elohim. That's the plural, the gods. It's a, that, that name is used 2,600 times in the Old Testament in reference to the one true God, Literally, the word means strong or powerful. To call something a god was to say, this is the strong one, this is the powerful one, the one with the power. It most often appears as Elohim, which is plural. There's some debate about exactly why that happens, but uh, we know even today we talk about the plural of majesty. The Queen of England can walk out and say, we have decided that we are going to, and, and she means I have decided I'm going, but... She uses the plural of majesty. That's a really old way to speak in a respectful tone. And so Elohim could be the plural of majesty. But in the New Testament, the writers say, don't you understand? God has always been three in one. It shows up in the Old Testament in creation. God creates everything. But when God creates man, do you remember what he says? He doesn't really talk before any of the other ones. He just says, let there be light. He separates the land, uh, the, the light and the dark and the land and the water. But then he says, it's time to make man. And what does God say? Let us make man in our image. You're like, wait a minute. It's that plural. Let us make man in our image. And in the New Testament, we find out. Jesus is the agent of creation. God speaks the word of creation. Genesis even tells us the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The three in one, the Trinity is there. The Godhead is present. But the first time that name El Elyon is used for God, it's not by Abraham. It's by Melchizedek. If you got your Bibles, turn to Genesis 14. Abraham's nephew Lot had gotten himself captured by a bunch of kings who had gotten together. This coalition of kings of Macedonia had come through and they had swept up Lot and his family along with some others. And Abraham gathers his men and he goes and rescues Lot. And on his way back, he comes to Salem. And in Genesis chapter 14, I'm going to skip down to verse 17 just so we can make sure we finish this up. The king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaba, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Keter Laomer. There's a name if you need a baby name. Keter Laomer and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, El Elyon. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, El Elyon possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So this, this mysterious priest king of Salem, Melchizedek, comes out. And he says, he, he is a priest of God most high. He says, blessed be Abraham God, or Abram of God most high, and blessed be God most high. And what does Melchizedek say about this El Elyon? What does he say? What does he tell us about him? What actions does he attribute to God? Delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave you the victory. There's one more. powerful one possessor of heaven and earth if you decide that what you really want is one of those nice Columbia jackets you've seen folks wearing them and you decide I want a Columbia jacket where do you have to go to get that Columbia jacket <laughs> anywhere that does what that sells columbia you got to go somewhere that sells what you're looking for if you decide that you want great value brand i don't know why but you're headed to walmart right 
You say, you know what? I love Sherway's rotisserie chicken. Well, you can't go just anywhere and get Sherway rotisserie chicken. You got to go where it is. When Melchizedek says God is the possessor of heaven and earth, you know what he means? Whatever you want, go to God for it. If you want it, he's got it. He, he, he owns heaven and earth. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. Well, what if you don't want stuff? I got five minutes. He says he's the God who defeats your enemies. I want success. He's the God who gives success. He says, God is God most high. Or literally, it is God is higher. Higher than what? Higher than everything. He is God most high. And so Abraham and Melchizedek, even though they don't have a lot in common, they both believe in this God most high, this one God who is the creator, who's higher than anything and anyone. And when they say God most high, they mean there's one true God. Don't bother looking anywhere else for meaning, for security, for safety. He is the, the God that is greater than all the other gods. To say that he is higher is to say he's higher than anything or anyone. He is the one who's worthy of our trust. And it's also to say he's the one you really ought to listen to. He's the one whose plan you follow. We're going to pick up there next week. Because there was no way I can get through the rest of this. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it means to serve the Most High God. Thanks for being with us in Bible class tonight.